But the devastation is when people we actually thought were our support systems, who had our backs, our families, our friends, our colleagues, people we may have even turned to in the past for help with this difficult relationship, when that group can be co-opted and can be infected. Let's talk about the silent treatment. It is so frustrating, okay? If you've ever been through it, you're like, oh, I know what you're talking about. The silent treatment is definitely one of the key weapons in the narcissist's arsenal. Many of you have asked me about this. I've gotten countless comments, emails, you name it. So here we go. Uh, maybe this belonged in the glossary series. I don't know. Regardless, here it is. So do with it what you will. So. The silent treatment is exactly what it sounds like. Now, let's give me give you, I'll give you an example. One day, perhaps you have an argument with somebody narcissistic or difficult in your life, or maybe that you issue a small criticism, or they just didn't like something you said or did. That happens, and they just stop talking to you. They just stop. Now, if you don't live with them they may stop answering any communications and may stop responding and stop reaching out. If you do live with them, they will live in silence with you. And if you talk to them, they will either ignore you or if it is essential, they may say something. At best, they'll give you a one word answer. Yes, no, over there, or they'll engage in a verbal gesture. Hey, you'll say, hey, where's the keys? And they will then put the keys in front of you and walk away without a word. Now, if you have ever lived with any of this, you know it. And it is miserable. You would almost just rather have the fight and not deal with this. It is an uncomfortable and very difficult way to live. And it's always kind of hanging over your head, this idea that, oh my gosh, the silent treatment is going to come again. So let's talk about the five classical reasons for the silent treatment. The first reason, the first reason is stonewalling or manipulation. In other words, what they're doing is they're using the silent treatment as a way to maybe draw out an apology, to punish you, to get you to do something that they mo may want to do um, or want you to do. So it's very much this, by stonewalling you, the reason it's considered to be a form of manipulation is because then it becomes a way of using their silence almost as a sort of a source of power of sorts. So that is one reason that they do engage in the silent treatment. It just becomes a manifestation of stonewalling with the result of manipulation. And then you end up behaviorally doing something they want, or in essence, they kind of almost get their needs met. The second thing that is seen within the silent treatment is gaslighting. What we can sometimes see is that they will, when somebody gives you the silent treatment, it almost feels as though your reality is being absolutely denied. You are in a room and you're with a person and they are not talking to you. And you're thinking, is this really happening? And then you might even start blaming yourself. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. This is my fault. Let me, and instead of seeing that the silent treatment is completely unacceptable, you may actually start twisting your reality in a way that you're blaming yourself and that in some way this silent treatment can actually feel like it becomes acceptable. It's not. A third element that is at play in stonewalling is that it's a manifestation of an emotional immaturity or really like a lack of interpersonal skill. When you think about what the silent treatment is, I don't know if you've ever watched a two and a half year old hold his or her breath. They will sometimes hold their breath until they pass out. So it is that I'm going to get my way and then they pass out. 
that's the silent treatment in an adult. I'm not getting my way. I'm not going to talk. It's a tantrum. It's a quiet tantrum, but it is nonetheless a tantrum. And tantrums are for children. So when somebody is throwing one as an adult through the, the silent treatment, it very much is a manifestation of not only emotional immaturity, but a real lack of interpersonal skill. Because what it really shows is an incapacity to communicate as an adult about something that's uncomfortable. And because narcissists find it so difficult to take personal responsibility for something that they may have said wrong or misunderstood, or they're really not able to find common ground, that lack of interpersonal skill means instead of actually having an evolved adult conversation, they will just simply do the silent treatment, which ultimately is a form of manipulation, which will end up drawing you out and you still have to be the only grown up in the room. Reason number four that can often draw out the silent treatment is dysregulation. And what do I mean by dysregulation? Dysregulation is the inability to regulate emotions in any way. It is why, for example, narcissists are so prone to rage. Something happens to them and they, pium, they blow up instead of, again, having an adult tempered conversation. So when we look at dysregulation with the silent treatment, it's as though there's so much strong, petulant feeling that instead of being able to regulate that feeling, they are actually manifesting this absolutely dysregulated anger by being completely silent. And what it does is it almost creates exactly the same tension as a rage episode would. But because they can't manage strong emotion, they either fully explode or completely withhold. But either way, the emotion is not getting appropriately communicated. And either way, whether rage or silent treatment, it can be experienced as very punitive by the other person in the relationship. A fifth driver of the silent treatment is the chronic victimhood we see in a narcissist. Woe is me. Nothing goes my way. Nobody understands me. I guess I just won't talk. And it can feel very passive aggressive. The victimhood driven silent treatment is something we far more often see in a covert narcissistic pattern. But the silent treatment is a part of every narcissistic pattern I've talked about. For example, in the neglectful narcissistic relationship, the neglectful narcissist lives and dies by the silent treatment. They are almost, it's like permanently what they call home. It's rare that they do talk. The malignant narcissist will often use the, the silent treatment as a form of menace or to control you. The covert narcissist, again, from that place of victimhood. But there is this very victimized sense about all kinds of narcissists, magnified in the covert narcissist, but the silent treatment is as though, woe is me, and it becomes sort of this passive aggressive acting out that ultimately leaves you sometimes even taking the blame in these conversations. A final, <coughs> sorry, a final piece of the silent treatment we haven't considered is the talking through model of the silent treatment. And by that I mean, it's a very manipulative tool that I've talked about in other videos where they won't talk to you, but they will talk through other people. Will you please tell your mother that the keys are hanging by the door? Will you please tell your father that I won't be joining him for dinner? So it's kind of sort of a pseudo silent treatment because obviously you can hear what they're saying, but they're making this, this dramatic histrionic show of I'm not going to talk to them. I'm only going to talk to whomever this third party is. And if you ever grew up like this, and this is a very triangulated theme, where one, a narcissistic parent, will use you as the child, as the communication device, to be able to punish the other spouse with the silent treatment, but then draw their kids into this triangulated space. The silent treatment, although it very much can come through, the stonewalling space, gaslighting, emotional immaturity or lack of interpersonal skill, dysregulation and victimhood, that those are really the five primary drivers for why the silent treatment comes through. It can manifest in many different ways. One word answers, 
absolute silence, talking through other people, and non-response. No matter what, it is a classical part of a narcissistic relationship. Here's the key, though. How do you master it? Don't give in to it. You can outplay them. It's a bit like a staring contest you had as a kid. They're going to give you that silent treatment. You're often going to fall into that trap of, maybe this is my fault. Maybe I need to apologize because you just want to break that tension of the silent treatment. You can really train yourself to not give in and say, okay, I can do, I can do a little bit of a post-it world. I can, I can communicate like this because you have put so much time and effort into trying to save this rather broken, often messy relationship. You can out-silent treat them. I'm not saying that this is healthy. I think the healthiest path is to communicate in a healthy way. But since they're likely not going to ascribe to that, you can also show yourself the respect and say, I'm certainly not going to blame myself for this. And say that to yourself internally. You don't need to say it to them. And then learn to peaceably exist with them. In fact, I would say you could pretend that if your narcissistic partner or family member is giving you the silent treatment, pretend you're at a silent meditation retreat and try to make the most of it. I don't mean to make light of it, but the fact is the reason narcissists get away with the silent treatment is because it often in, we often enable it because we give them the results we want. We apologize, take the blame, take the responsibility, do anything we can to start the conversation again because it's so tense. You can stick this out, but most importantly, view the silent treatment as the red flag that it is. It is a very unhealthy relationship dynamic. And when it happens, the one thing that you should be hearing loudly in the midst of all this silence is that you're looking at one very big red flag. Now, as many of you know from your own experiences, one of the most maddening patterns of the narcissistic relationship is the blame shifting. Even when they get caught in something, a lie, a betrayal, or some other form of bad behavior, instead of taking responsibility or owning up to it, they will deflect blame and say everything from people out to get them, this is a witch hunt, or that it's your fault that they cheated because you weren't affectionate enough or didn't make them feel special enough, or that they lied to you to protect your feelings because you're sensitive. In fact, let's use the comments here. Drop into the comments the creative ways that the narcissist in your life deflected blame and managed to blame you for their bad behavior. I'm sure there's going to be some doozies. Now, I get lots of questions about blame shifting because it is such an angering part of this relationship dynamic, and it happens in all narcissistic relationships, romantic, family, workplace, friendship. Honestly, it's as though narcissistic people are allergic to taking responsibility, but it can help to see blame shifting from the perspective of gaslighting because ultimately that is what it is. So let's break it down in the most basic way. A person lies. Now, a primary way that we try to debunk a lie is to present the evidence to the contrary, or that, you know, that it's a, a, literally a mis misrepresentation. Then the liar either has to cop to the lie or double down on the lie and break down the evidence bringer. So they'll do things like call the person names or call them petty or tell them that there's something wrong with them or cast doubt on the evidence they're bringing. Blaming the evidence bringer, the person who's trying to debunk the lie, the person who is in essence telling them that they are wrong, is a way to break down the person who's calling them out. Gaslighting as you all know, is denying someone's reality, then telling that person that there's something wrong with them and to keep doing this repeatedly until the gaslighted person is so broken down that they just go along with the gaslighter without even having to be asked. Blame shifting is a part of that part pattern. If someone has done something wrong and then asserts that you are the one to blame, that is gaslighting. It also may be a little bit of projection. And as a reminder, in case you've forgotten, gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse. It's for this reason that blame shifting feels so awful. It's not just that they are trying to get away with something, but in order to do that, they are manipulating your reality. But people who have experienced repeated narcissistic abuse and gaslighting, unfortunately, because of years of grooming and conditioning, they're will often willing to accept the blame. And that's why blame shifting works. 
And once the narcissistic person recognizes that you are fertile ground in which to plant blame, they will keep doing it. If you have been ha experiencing blame shifting on, since childhood, then your tendency for self-blame is pretty potent. And every time the blame is shifted, there is a major risk that you will accept it. And over time, to keep accepting blame for things you didn't do wears you down. Obviously, the best way to break down a gaslighter or a blame shifter is to hold on to your reality, not to try to present evidence or try to prove your point, but just hold on to your reality. Don't defend your reality or fight for your reality because they aren't listening. Just hold on to it. So when they blame you, for example, they tell you that the reason they cheated was because you were never around. Ultimately, the issue at hand is their cheating, not the reason for the cheating. They cheated. That's the reality. That's all the reality you got. If they won't take responsibility for that behavior, the fact is then you're sunk. No change whatsoever can happen in the relationship. And I promise you this, they will keep cheating. Blame shifting works because we get so lost in trying to defend the blame shifted part. Oh, I cheated because you were never around that we lose the focus on the original behavior in question, which is the lying or the betrayal or the bad behavior. <sniffs> Got to put the lens back, right? This even applies in a simple issue. Let me give you an example. A person goes to the grocery store, a narcissistic person goes to the grocery store, they get the wrong food. They come home and you say, hey, I'm looking through the bag, you forgot the milk. I had written milk down on the list. Then they say, you ask me to do too much. There's too much on this list. It's your fault for being so demanding and asking me to get groceries on a day when I'm so busy. The issue is that they forgot the milk. That hasn't changed. There's no need to get into it with them, but they didn't mention the part about forgetting the milk. The fact is all you can do is plan on going back out or take them off of grocery patrol. The blame shifting is obviously a way for the narcissistic person to hold on to their grandiose view of themselves, to regulate against the shame and the discomfort of inadequacy. Well, if it's your fault, then there's nothing wrong with them, right? And their singular goal is to hold on to a pristine version of themselves, even if it means destroying the mental health of everyone around them. As long as they look good, nothing else matters. There is no point in having the fight about the forgotten milk. Lots of people will have it, but there's no point because here's the bottom line. They didn't get the milk. There's no milk. So you either going to make life work without that milk right now, or you go get it yourself. The challenge is that people get into the argument about the forgotten milk and that never gets up in a good place, ends up in a good place because they're blaming you for giving them a long grocery list. You're having the wrong argument. Radical acceptance. They don't care enough to do the groceries right. So if something is high stakes, I got to recognize I got to do it myself. It's exhausting, but it beats the hell out of a 30 minute fight about how demanding you are in that much time. It was a pointless argument. You could have gotten the damned milk yourself. It's useful to see blame shifting as gaslighting because then you see what is designed to do. It's designed to protect them, devalue you and break you down and leave you more confused than when you began. It does mean intentionally and mindfully not allowing yourself to lose the plot. The original issue never does get resolved, whether it's their cheating or forgetting the milk. But not getting confused by the blame shifting is an important tool for not getting more confused on the daily by these relationships. So again, there is a lie. That's the issue. There's bad behavior. That's what happens, right? And then they turn it into you're too demanding. You did this, you did that. And then you, the risk is like, no, I didn't. Or yeah, it wasn't that much. Or you've been not working. You're, then you have having an argument about the grocery list and them going to the store. They forgot the milk. Or about the cheating. Well, I, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. Yeah, I hung out with someone else. Hung out, that's nice. Hung out with someone else because you were never around. You never being around is not the issue. Their cheating is the issue. Always move the lens, the spotlight in your mind, not in the argument because that's pointless, to the original issue and say, this person cheated, this person didn't get the milk. The rest of it, not even relevant. So if you have ever been on the receiving end of a smear campaign, first of all, I do not envy you. It's absolutely awful. But if you've ever been on the receiving end of a smear campaign initiated by a narcissistic person, you know that it may be one of the most confusing, 
destabilizing, heartbreaking, and am I losing my mind experiences you can have. So let's then think about what the core of gaslighting is. Gaslighting is not just a dismantling of reality. That's one essential piece. But there's also that piece of attempting to paint you and convincing you that there's something wrong with you. Gaslighting is a consistent sort of process. So it's repeated so often that if we don't know what's happening, we may actually start believing that we're impaired, we've lost, tu we've lost touch with the reality, and that we are seeing and recalling and experiencing things the wrong way. Another reason gaslighting works is because it's perpetrated by someone that you have trust in for some reason. They may be a family member, a person you're in a committed relationship with, a close friend, or even someone who's an expert in their field. So you trust them, making their word have more weight and more value. Now, imagine that five people, ten people, are doing the same thing. Multiple people you know and trust, maybe even love, a group of family members, a group of friends, a set of colleagues, all buying into something that not only is in defiance of reality, but also paints you as bad or dishonest or incompetent or cruel or manipulative or even as narcissistic. I don't think we sufficiently recognize how harmful smear campaigns can be, not just to reputation, but to how they hurt us psychologically. It's bad enough going through narcissistic abuse with one person, but then when the people around you don't see it and aren't willing to recognize it, they may actually buy what the narcissistic gaslighter is saying as plausible. And then they, that group of people, may go all in and be willing to believe the distortions and this presentation and narrative of you as impaired. It's one thing that the narcissistic person is doing a bad thing. We sort of expect it. After enough time, even when we're feeling upside down, we have been invalidated and criticized, criticized and just treated badly enough for long enough that we aren't surprised that they are not nice to us. It doesn't feel good. But radical acceptance, if you've been working at this, radical acceptance often does kick in. At least we can see it clearly. But the devastation is when people we actually thought were our support systems, who had our backs, our families, our friends, our colleagues, people we may have even turned to in the past for help with this difficult relationship, when that group can be co-opted and can be infected. Listen, the narcissistic person manipulated and tricked and charmed you for a long time. Why don't, they, why don't we think that they can get to everyone else too? They can and they do. Smear campaigns can happen quickly. And for example, when a relationship ends, the narcissistic person mobilizes pretty quickly and they may get to the other people who are close to you and sell their version of events and convince people of their narrative. And then and more often than not, a lot of other people will go with it. This can also happen slowly over time. And even years later, you may hear something from someone that shows you that even again, years later, that the narcissistic person is not giving it a rest and is continuing to paint a twisted and unkind picture of you and any events that unfolded between the two of you. But ultimately, all smear campaigns are gaslighting campaigns. Campaigns. It's a group of people denying reality and painting you as impaired. Maybe someone might come up to your old friend might say, oh, maybe you were too demanding in the relationship and that's why it didn't work out. Maybe you were too anxious. Or they might say, oh, they made it sound like you were doing some shady stuff. Uh, you always did have a temper. When gaslighting is a group event, it is a thousand times more potent. But one person doing a smear campaign is able to distort many people's reality and most pointedly yours. I know that when I have experienced this, I scratch my head and question myself and saying, multiple people are saying this, could this be true? But the only antidote I have in my life 
are the people who are my anti-gaslighters and the counterweight against the BS. I hope all of you have at least one person in your life who can be that for you. Doesn't make the smear campaign hurt less, but at least you don't feel like you've completely lost it. Smear campaigns can completely complicate the processing of grief and other feelings after a narcissistic relationship. It feels as though you're amounting multiple losses. You're just losing multiple people. But for any of you who have been through a smear campaign, at least maybe thinking about framing it as gaslighting can be a wake-up call on why the smear campaign is not only so destabilizing, but why you, you feel your heart has broken in so many ways. This is utter devastation. Smear campaigns, many people will say, you know what, after a while I figured out the narcissistic abuse. But the idea that people I even went to about this relationship ended up falling in line with what the narcissistic person was saying or implying about me or twisting facts or whatever, it was a, that they said that was the real devastation because they were supposed to be my soft place to land. So make no mistake, smear campaigns really are just large scale gaslighting and gaslighting, no gaslighting, whatever. We do know that smear campaigns, smear campaigns are something that can really impair a person's ability to heal and move forward from these relationships. So today I'm going to specifically talk about the issue of financial abuse, which is often a piece of a relational dynamic that is sometimes seen in narcissistic relationships, a larger dynamic called coercive control. So let me actually just set a scene of financial abuse for you. Let's set the scene. Two people meet, a controlling narcissist and an unwitting new partner. They start spending time together. The controlling person they're a little bit intense, a little bit love bomby. They offer to pay for everything. They want to spend a lot of time together. It may even feel awkward initially or not if there is maybe something soothing about someone taking care of all the costs. But then that new controlling, that the new, I'm sorry, the new unwitting partner gets used to it and they go with it and the control, controlling partner is now paying for everything. And that controlling narcissist may also be controlling in other ways. They'll often ask the new partner, hey, where are you? What are you doing? When are you going to be home? Who are you with? Lots of texting, lots of calls, constant control. And they may also slowly isolate that person, expect that all that money they're spending on this person should translate into all of their new partner's time. Initially, this may be misread by this new partner as interest or intensity or they're really into me. Time goes on and the controlling narcissist may even up the ante on the money, perhaps buying bigger ticket items like a car as a gift or encouraging the new partner to move in with them because, hey, we're already spending so much time together anyhow. Why do you need your own place or live in with roommates? Move in with me. It'll all be happening fast. And then the controlling partner starts to go in bigger. Somehow it may culminate in suggesting that the new partner leave their job or their source of income or employment. The narcissist will grandiosely proclaim that, oh, well, I'll take care of you and they'll take care of the new partner. In fact, they may even get them a credit card that'll have a limit, of course, or give them an allowance that they control. And initially and over time, many people in these situations will say, gosh, I thought we were on the same page. After we got married, I thought I'd stay home and maintain the house and take care of the family and my partner will make the money and then I could ease my partner's stress and we'd be working together as a team and toward the same goal or they'd say, oh, because of this, I could go back to school because I really thought my partner believed in me. The narrative and the rationalization works for a while and it plays into what can sometimes look, for example, like a classical family structure for so long, right? until it goes wrong. And with a narcissist, it always goes wrong. And without money, people cannot escape these relationships. And in that way, the financial abuse observed in narcissistic relationships can set up an almost inescapable situation that guarantees that the fragile narcissist will not be abandoned and then can result in tremendous psychological harm to that unwitting person who is now financially stuck. This sets the scene and this plays out with people with both lots of money 
and with people who have very little money. The dollar amounts may vary, but the financial imprisonment is the same. Obviously, these scenarios are much more dangerous for those with less resources because they'll have less options, but imprisonment's imprisonment. Remember that relational control is a hallmark dynamic of narcissistic relationships. They don't like it when they're not in charge of the narrative. And so they control the story using money, coercion, manipulation. A narcissistic relationship isn't about balance or reciprocity or empathy. It's about power and control. Now, narcissistic people often financially abuse other people. They will make promises about money and then they will rescind those promises. For example, they'll say, oh yeah, I'll be happy to give you a loan for your business or tuition for school. And then just when the bill comes due, they no longer want to give it to you. They will often make people financially dependent on them, basically turning their partners into indentured personal assistants, maids, butlers, dinner companions, and sex partners. And they will remind their partners that, hey, I pay for everything. And as part of the devaluation and invalidation we see in these relationships, we'll call their partner selfish or spoiled for wanting something simple around the house or for groceries, or maybe even just to get a small holiday or birthday gift for somebody. Financial abuse means that the narcissist will control all of the financial accounts, have all of the passwords, file the taxes, and since too often they become, they're the main source of money, they can move it around as they see fit. They will often manipulate the amount of money their partners have access to, leaving their partner completely reliant on the narcissistic partner for money, shelter, food, everything. The narcissistic person will set it up so that their partners will have to ask for money for even basics and essentials. And trust me, those love bomby days of big dinners out, probably gone. And they will often berate and shame their partners for being wasteful. I've heard stories of multi, multi-millionaire narcissists having their partners practically beg for money for their children's shoes or clothing or doctor's appointments and screaming and raging when anyone asks them for anything, but then picking up the check for 20 people for dinner. That rage would terrify everyone in the household, so slowly nobody would ask for money anymore and people were essentially imprisoned in their gilded or in some cases their not so gilded cages. Financial control is a key element of coercive control, and it doesn't just happen in intimate relationships. It can happen, for example, in family systems, a family matriarch or patriarch constantly moving around who gets what in terms of money in a will or a trust, or the recognition that in order to benefit from a parent's money, you had to play their game or a toxic sibling sidling up to their aging parent and siphoning off money from family accounts and getting control of those finances. Because money is such an essential tool, narcissistic people will weaponize it and use it to control all kinds of relationships. The financial abuse observed in narcissistic relationships is actually a key element of what makes these divorces so horrific. Let's remember, narcissistic people do not like losing control. And least of all, they do not like losing control of their money. And in the divorce process means that they will be asked to hand some of their money over. As a result, these are divorces characterized by manipulation, menace, threats, rage, fear, and lots of shenanigans such as hiding money, turning off electricity and water to the house, refusal to pay spousal or child support, the list goes on. In one trick I've heard many times is that narcissistic people will conveniently lose their jobs during or right after the divorce proceedings and then use that as a way to skirt spousal or child support and will have often even more conveniently found jobs where they get paid in cash or under the table or through other secret means so they don't have to take care of their now discarded families financial abuse becomes a game for them, a cat and mouse game where they get to continue to exert power and dominance. The harms of financial abuse are felt most acutely amongst those who don't have much to start with.
The little bit of money a person may use to control another person can mean that there's very little resource or support to figure a way out. And many people in financially abusive narcissistic relationship situations may have been out of the workforce for a while, meaning that they may not be readily employable or have access only to lower paying positions or minimum wage positions that may not provide enough funds to live independently, pay for legal services, or care for children. Financial abuse, especially as seen in a dynamic such as coercive control, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It often occurs alongside other dynamics such as somebody getting isolated from friends and family or having cell phones, computers, and other communication activity monitored because these devices are paid for by the narcissistic person. And that makes the ability to get help even less likely and perhaps at times even dangerous. Money is one of those things that takes the toxic elements, the most toxic elements of these toxic relationships and makes it worse. And many people who go through this blame themselves for being stupid and naive and for not seeing it. And they blame themselves for quitting their jobs and for allowing themselves to become financially dependent on someone. Don't blame yourself. It's normal and even healthy to view a relationship as a partnership with two people drawing their resources of time and money together for a larger goal. Unfortunately, that shared and equal vision is not a part of the narcissistic relationship. And for many difficult and toxic people out there, just like the car in their driveway or the watch on their arm, they view relationships and people as things that are bought and paid for. So I'm going to start with by saying something stupid and bear with me for a minute. So years ago, and most of you were not born when this happened, okay? But years ago, I was literally just out of college and broke and living in New York City and saved some money, went to a movie. It was like the late 1980s. And a movie came out that was called Working Girl. It was sort of Melanie Griffith's kind of breakout role and it featured a young Harrison Ford. And the plot was basically that she was sort of like this in a secretarial assistant level position, but she had much higher aspirations. And the whole movie was about her journey through all of that. There was a scene in the movie where this assistant woman, the Melanie Griffith character, walks in on her fiancé having sex with their mutual friend. He thought, the fian her, her uh, fiancé thought that, that Melanie Griffith would be at business school in the evening, but class got canceled. She then quickly moves out of their apartment and moves into the boss of her, uh, the, her boss's apartment, who happened to be out of town. Well, and then the assistant, the Melanie Griffith character, and the cheating fiancé run into each other at a party some weeks later. They both had to attend it because it was an engagement party of close friends of theirs, not, not the woman he was having sex with. At the party, the two of them start drinking again, talking a little, even have a romantic dance. The narcissistic ex-fiancé was caught up in the grandiose moment. And then he asks her to marry him. He asks Melanie Griffith to marry him in front of everyone at the party. Remember, this is the first she's seeing him after the cheating incident. She makes a cheeky response to him like, oh, I'll think about it. And his fragile ego is so wounded, despite doing that inappropriate thing. And he follows her out and yells at her. And even the people in the audience kind of were shaming her and saying, how could you make me look so foolish in front of everyone? Now, in this particular case, her character kind of held her ground and didn't succumb to his manipulative BS. But I would love for all of you to think about a moment when you were publicly cornered or manipulated or mocked or insulted or shamed by a narcissistic person in front of a group of people and you didn't feel like there was much you could do. You certainly couldn't have a conversation about it. You didn't even feel like you could have a strong reaction because you were concerned about how other people would view it. Or if you did have a strong reaction, you knew that the narcissist would paint you out as being difficult or dramatic. And other people, not fully understanding your relationship, may have seen your reaction as disproportionate. So if you have any of those kinds of tales or that resonates with you, drop that in the comments. Now, this entire video is inspired by some questions we have received. This idea of a narcissistic person using a public moment or being in public where they know you're kind of cornered and silenced 
And so they say something really inappropriate. And if you have a strong reaction or an emotional reaction that wouldn't be appropriate for the setting, you can't say anything. So you're sort of felt left feeling sick, biting your tongue, and maybe enraged. And one of the emails, the email writer to me said that this happened, for example, with her, with a toxic colleague. In those cases, you may even be more limited because of sort of the culture of the workplace. Now remember, for narcissistic people, everything is tactical and strategic. So making you look foolish in front of other people where you can't defend yourself allows them to feel elevated. And if you react to them strongly, then they get even more smug because you had a strong emotional reaction. They may also let you down in a significant way in front of other people. Perhaps you keep asking them quietly, could you get the diaper bag? Could you get the diaper bag? And you're in a public setting and they keep ignoring you and you're in sort of a messy, impossible situation. And then you raise your voice and say, could you get me the diaper bag? And people hear you screeching for a diaper bag. It fortifies then their agenda of portraying you as unhinged and them as the long, long suffering one. Like, oh, can you believe this one? Now this happens in the workplace when you may be put on the spot by a colleague saying something like, hey, weren't you saying how the manager of our division would never be able to make our sales quotas for this quarter? And look, we exceeded them. And the manager's at the meeting and sort of glaring at you. Narcissistic folks will take your confessions, your confidences, and use them as a weapon or a tool when it will give them a significant advantage, especially in a public setting where there is nothing graceful you can do about it in the moment. If you do take it seriously and actually attempt to have a discussion or ask the narcissistic person to stop doing that or you share your feelings, Many times the narcissistic person will say, oh, come on, it's just a joke. Can't you take a joke? That's a classical narcissistic play to make you look overly sensitive and them as just so cool and above it all. And it further paints you into a corner and makes it harder for you in a sort of clear way to say, can you see what's happening to other people? So what do you do? Now, the lady from the movie, she just didn't fall for it. She didn't give him the answer he wanted and walked out on his ridiculous marriage proposal. She endured his rage and ended the relationship. It's a movie. In real life, the key way to approach this is to stay calm. Your calmness will defeat their argument that you're dysregulated. And this is not always easy when you're being publicly humiliated. If it's a social situation and not a meeting where like workplace where you might be creating a problem for yourself if you were to leave, you may be able to excuse yourself and step away. If someone asks you where you went or why you stepped away, they come find you. You can explain calmly that you were uncomfortable. And if the person asking you if you're okay said, oh, I think he was joking, file that away because enabler alert but just hold your position. Let that person who comes to check on you know that you weren't okay with it. It was embarrassing and inappropriate. And let that person know, I'm not gonna give them their moment to play the bully at my expense. At some point it is about holding our ground. I'm not saying this is easy to do, but it can be done. But many times our self-doubt stops us. Narcissistic people derive their power because we aren't willing to walk away shut them down or shut the enablers down. Breathe in and recognize that their public baiting of you is a way for them to get supply with zero empathy for how it affects you. Don't storm off. Wait for a normal break in the action. Step away and when you are in private with the baiter, if you want to lay it out to them, you can. They're not going to listen and they're going to make it into a joke. But I know some of you out there say, I just need to state my piece. I need to say it. If you do this, then you're doing it for you, not because you think you're getting it through to them. Now, if the baiting person isn't someone you have to spend time with, then don't. If you do have to spend time with them, then do the whole don't go deep thing. Don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, don't personalize. And the detachment process slowly has to begin. If you can avoid public situations with this person who's done this to you, then, then avoid them. 
And if you can have an ally at the table with you, maybe a friend who sees it, try and set it up that way. Because perhaps that friend is a third party can shut it down much more easily than you can. And it's a more powerful play because now the narcissist runs the risk themselves of being publicly shamed and it's not you doing it. This public shaming that narcissists do, one person who emailed me called it public extortion or public blackmailing. It's one more power play in form of bullying and baiting. When it happens, it hurts, it stings, and it's uncomfortable. But the important thing is to don't engage it. And if you can find a way to distance from this person, now is a good time to begin. Narcissistic people are eternally walking around and marking their territory, almost like using any chance they can to get an upper hand, to get advantage. When you react, they play it off as a joke. And so if you can show them you, they, or you aren't reacting to them and simultaneous to that, you start disengaging and you can weather the enablers, that's the win. It's not easy to do but it's something you can do over time. And that is the best way to handle those sorts of publicly manipulative, uncomfortable situations that narcissists quite often create for other people. Thanks again.